Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, author Judy Barrett spices things up with herbs for health, flavor, and visual texture. She's got a few surprises in store for us, too. On tour, get eye-opening lessons from fifth graders about watershed safety. Daphne explains how she recycles water and makes her pick of the week. And Trisha's got your backyard basic tips. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. We hear a lot about the watershed, but how can we make a difference? Let's get a few eye-opening lessons from some very wise fifth graders. At Becker Elementary, not every lesson is indoors. With a trek across the street to their green classroom, they dig into gardens that extend the curriculum through hands-on science and ecology in a living space. As students plant and nurture, they cultivate patience and problem solving along with good taste. I've had the benefit of working with second graders and fifth graders as a, as a volunteer teacher and it has been an, a remarkable learning experience for me. Each class has its own specified garden space and we work with them throughout the year to learn about gardening. We learn about the seasons of various vegetable plants and learning about ones that you can plant in the fall versus the spring and they follow it through from beginning to the end. Other Austin Independent School District fifth graders grow to learn through the City of Austin's Earth Camp Gardens. Earth Camp is an award-winning water quality field science program where students spend four days at outdoor sites learning about stewardship of their water resources. A class from Blazier Elementary is one that finished Earth Camp at the Green Classroom. I just know that I had a lot of fun when I was a kid helping my mother. A lot of them don't have their own homes. I mean, they do a lot of rentals in, in our area. Some of them do, but I think it's also fun it's for them to at least get out there and see some of this, or, you know, what it's like to get into a garden. Um, and some of them might take it on the responsibility to do it at home as well. Children see how to make compost and learn why it's better than fertilizers that create algae when they leach into the watershed. How many of you have families that compost? Now, where do I put all this? In the compost. Trash. Compost, that's right. Just get in there. You keep on shaking. Growing a little seed or plant that they can eat is a major hit. Oh, spinach, I love spinach. All right. Here you go. All right, you have broccoli, you have spinach, and you have Swiss chard. Okay, so let's go find our spots. So what you're going to do is dig a, a little hole that's, you want it to be as deep as this pot. Okay? There you go, there you go. And now, we we're going to put it in here. There we go. Harvesting totally rocks. Well, these are radishes. Have y'all ever eaten radishes? Yeah, they're my yeah. favorite. The peel off a radish, but do you see how that's kind of black and has the dirt embedded in it? Yes. So I'm peeling it just for that reason. But, mm. What does that taste like? Yeah, spicy. Ah, hot. Since bugs like gardens too, children identify beneficial insects that control the pests. If the garden needs extra help, they see how to do it without pesticides. People will say like, oh, they're under, they're underground, and then they'll look underground and there's nothing. And then they'll say, oh, they don't know that we're under the stones. But then we check. Weeds come up for every gardener too. What do they put on them to make them go away? Weed killer. Weed killer, yes, it's called herbicide. Now, if herbicide were to get in the creek, do y'all know what would happen? Every lesson connects to the watershed and how what we put on the ground affects the water that we drink. Remember at Martin Springs, where you saw that fault that was on the diagonal? These are cubes that it show different areas around Austin. And what they are doing is learning about the watershed, the land on top, and the groundwater, the land underneath, and different things that affect that water. We think that's an oil spill. Showing about mm, the Edwards limestone, 
because it, it, that looks like the entrance of the game. The landfill is like where all the trash is, like where the pollution is in the water. With a model of the Bolden Creek watershed, students deposit drops of colored water to indicate fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, soap, and even pet waste. Then they simulate rain three times. Two, three, four, five. Stop. One, two, three. All right. So, did our watershed eventually get clean? Has it washed away? Did it harm everything in the creek as yes. it went down? Yes. And then it collected down in the river. And what do we do with that river water? We use it to drink. Another demonstration illustrates how ground surface affects what runs off or what soaks in. What do they put on it to make it grow sometimes? That white Fertilizer. Fertilizer, yes. Okay. Now here's our natural nature filter. Are any chemicals put on this? No. No, no these are our natural plants. So do you think it will come out clear? Yes. Do you think it'll run off clear? Yes. Again using colored water, the students simulate chemical deposits on each surface. Okay, so just tip it and rain. This is a surface runoff. So what would run off quickly during a storm? And this is what would infiltrate and come through the whole soil and root system, which can grab up or absorb many types of pollutants. Why is the grass running off and not the natives? Because it has more chemicals. And it's not. The chemicals don't make it run off quicker. What makes it run off quicker is the sh are the short roots. That grass only has roots about this long. And the natives have roots that can go up to 15 feet deep. And so that allows more of the water to go into the ground rather than run off like this one possibly with chemicals. Rain gardens are another way for water to be captured and treated on site. And it, this was something that was a natural fit into the green garden classroom and another tool for kids to learn about how uh, they can be connected to their environment. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of built eight inches down in the ground and it has native plants. A rain garden is uh, it's a natural depression in the landscape and what it does is it captures rainwater that it runs off of impervious surfaces that are nearby. So that can be a rooftop like in the classroom. It can be sidewalks, uh, it can be your driveway. Any place where you have a hard surface, um, you can dig a natural depression near it to capture the water off that surface before it runs off of your yard and to the nearby streets, which then in turn uh, takes that water to the gutter systems, the storm sewer systems, and then directly into our creeks. The Green Classroom's collection system also demonstrates how to harvest rainfall to keep it on site to water their food when rain doesn't come. These lessons are not just for today. They will stick with these children as they grow up to make a difference for the future. When you come out to the Green Garden Classroom, you really feel the, the mission, the magic of this classroom and this space and what it can do for kids because they can get out and have a lot of hands-on activities to learn about uh, their environment. You can make a difference. Keep Austin green. Thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. And now we're going to be ju visiting with Judy Barrett from Homegrown Texas, a wonderful local magazine that uh, tells folks all about gardening in the Lone Star State. Uh, it's great to have you back on Central it's Texas Good to Garden. be here. Well, we have a lot to talk about with you. You are a busy lady writing books, <laughs> uh, putting out a magazine. Uh, I'm, I'm gardening. Not, gardening. <laughs> that takes a little time. A little, yeah. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good way to spend the time. Well, I started Homegrown as a paper publication mm -hmm. and published it for 12 years. Mm -hmm. It was the only organic gardening for Texas magazine mm -hmm. at that time. During that time, things changed, and it became more popular to be an organic gardener. Right. Um, so you led I the stopped. way, in other words. I did. <laughs> so I stopped after 12 years, and for two years didn't do anything. And then I thought, well, I could do this online there and you not go. have to pay the printer, not have to pay the post office. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing now. It's a monthly. Um, all you have to do is send me an email, and I'll let you know when it's ready. Homegrowntexas.com. That's and it. 
and uh, chock full of good advice. And you know, it, it is amazing to think how much gardening has changed uh, in the past 15 or 20 years. Well, it has changed. Um, people's approach has changed, and the climate has changed. Mm -hmm. So our attitudes have changed. Right. Um, we, we, we're all having to adjust. And <laughs> part of that adjustment, I think, it, it's, it's uh, necessary just, you talk about climate change, when you have a two year long devastating drought, you've got to uh, react to that. Right. But the other part of it though is you're responding to kind of a sense of responsibility and also a longing for you know a better way to do the things that you're doing. And I think the organic gardening movement has a lot of that in it. I think so too. And also, in fact, it's easier. It's I cheaper. I agree with you. I agree with you. And it's more fun. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about poisoning your exactly. friends and pets. Yeah. And so, no, yeah. You know, that was one of the things, that was a revelation for me about 20 years ago when I started seriously making the transition to organic gardening mm -hmm. was that, wow, this is actually a lot easier. Yeah. Than the, all you, and figuring out which of these dangerous chemicals to use when and how do you protect yourself when you're using them and all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah. it was a relief and it was easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so, and cheaper. Right. So <laughs> folks can find uh, Homegrown's online. Online. But, but you also have been busy with books. I have. The that, first book I did was way back in mm -hmm. the 80s, I mm -hmm. believe, or early 90s, and it was the mm -hmm. Tomatillo book. And we're all very grateful for you for <laughs> spreading the gospel of Tomatillo. <laughs> well, you know, at that time, there was not that much information right. about Tomatillo. You know, you never saw them in the stores. You didn't, no, and if you did, was. they were real expensive. Right, right. So I got, I always grow something weird in every mm -hmm. garden. And that year it was Tomatillos. And I ended up with six million Tomatillos. <laughs> And I couldn't figure out what to do with them. I mean, you can only eat so much salsa. Right. <laughs> so I started investigating the plant and recipes, and the result was the book. Okay, so Tomatillas led the way, but then came, what can I do with my herbs? Right. Uh, followed by what makes heirlooms plants, heirloom plants so great, and recipes from and for the garden. Right. So busy lady. I tried it. Stay busy. Well, that, you know about gardeners. idle hands. <laughs> <laughs> idle hands are dangerous. We're, you know, there's a lot here that we can talk about, and I want to save the discussion for herbs where you started your book writing for last, because you've brought some herbs we're going to talk about. Right. But uh, let's let's skip ahead to the heirloom plants because this is something that I'm really passionate about. <clears throat> I love uh, heirloom tomatoes. There's just something really special about a lot of those different varieties. Why, why do you uh, love heirlooms? Well, there are two sides of it. There's just simply the flavor, mm -hmm. the smell, the look of older plants mm -hmm. that are just better. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the sort of social conscience part. Um, it's important to keep all these varieties going because we don't know what they might have to offer. Right, um, genetically. And mm -hmm. so, and it's fun. It's mm -hmm. fun to have different kinds of things, different looking vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, the the so tomatoes there are a lot can of good look, reasons. <laughs> can look a little crazy. <laughs> they but, can. But their flavor is unique, and, and every time you taste one, it's like, it's a revelation because there's, there's a wide variety of different possibilities mm -hmm. with those tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's true of squash and mm -hmm. cucumbers and all different kinds of things. Oh, flowers. Yeah. Sure, <laughs> sure. Heirloom flowers, yeah. right. No, yeah. that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that and uh, certainly love the fact that you were a pioneer in terms of spreading the gospel of the heirloom <laughs> of, of vegetable varieties and flower varieties out there. Yeah. You're a cook as well. You've been busy with uh, I recipes. I am a cook. Um, the recipe book includes not only food, but recipes you can make like fertilizers, bug sprays, all kinds of things you can make from what grows in your garden, ah, so, not just food. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, there are a lot of natural pesticides and things like that, yes. or you know, ways yeah. of, at least to, to chase the critters off. If That's right. Else. That's right. You don't need to <clears throat> kill them. You just need to get them out of your yard. Her, you're a critter herder. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard. 
cats and other things too. So I understand all about critter herding. So that brings us to uh, talking about herbs, and this is a favorite topic for you, I know. It is. Um, herbs have so much personality. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they've got stories, they've got history, they've got lots right. of different uses. Okay. Well, so you, they're fun. They're, they're, you've brought some herbs with you, <laughs> and um, every, as you say, every herb has a story. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And I'm looking at, for those who don't know, uh, this uh, object is a mullen stalk, mm -hmm. uh, the flower bloom from mullen, which is a, a, a common herb. It uh, is. Actually, you can find it growing in fields around Texas. Well, the flowers spread their seeds yes, wherever yeah. they go. Right, right. So you pro folks have probably encountered this. What do you use mullen for as an herb? Well, it's an old medicinal herb. Mm -hmm. It was used for years for, you can make a tea and it's good for cough, chest uh, congestion. Uh, okay. You can soak the flowers in oil and put them in your ears if you have an earache. Um, you can make a compound to draw out sores with the leaves. There are lots of different things you can do. I'm told you can make a headache remedy with it. But, right. I mean, a hangover remedy, oh, but, but you, I, of course, don't know about that. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know either, but uh, so mullen, an old favorite, again, a common one, and I just like the leaves on the mullen, I gotta say. Yeah, <laughs> the, they're really velvety, mm -hmm. gotcha. and they were used in the olden days by soldiers who would pick them and stuff them in their shoes oh. as they marched across the countryside and yeah. little, they made them feel better Dr. and they Schultz were comfortable. Dr. Schultz inserts That's in the right. Civil War. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. right. Okay, That's very right. good. Well, ginger, everybody knows about uh, culinary uses for ginger. Uh, this is, uh, I'm assuming right. you use it primarily for culinary purposes right. as well. Right, right. Um, ginger is a very versatile herb. You know, most herbs will do multiple things. Sure. They're multitaskers. Mm -hmm. um, ginger is a great medicinal herb. It's great for upset stomachs of every kind. Yeah. And I recently talked to a woman who had been through chemotherapy, and she said ginger tea worked better than any prescription drug she had gotten. Doesn't surprise me. Yeah. A moment I was a little kid when I had an upset stomach, my mom said ginger ale. Yeah. That was, that oh, was yeah. her, that was her yeah. herbal remedy. Right. And I love the ginger ale, so there right. you go. <laughs> and gingerbread, which mm. we all know as dessert, began as a digestive. It was put on the table after a big meal to make you feel better. Well, I did not know that. And it was not the lovely sweet treat we know. It was a slab of bread with some ginger smashed into it. So. <laughs> a little stouter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, Judy, uh, some of the stories have percolated out. It's been a lot of fun. I hope people will visit you online as well as uh, I hope uh, so too. peruse the bookstores and uh, online for your wonderful books. So thank you for being our guest. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's always a pleasure and good luck to you. Coming up next is our friend Daphne. I'm Daphne Richards and this is Augie. Our question this week is about water harvesting inside the home. Many people capture the cold water from the sink or the shower while they're waiting for it to heat up, which is great, but you can also capture water while you shower. It's especially easy if you live in a newer home, since a lot of new construction tends to have standalone showers separate from the bathtub. You just need a few buckets and you can capture several gallons of water every time you shower. This may not sound like much, but in our continued drought, a few gallons go a long way. In my shower, I use two round buckets, but the real key is a flat-sided bucket that I put between them. I can press the flat bucket up against the back of the shower and catch all of the water that misses me and bounces off the wall. I use this water normally on my oak trees in the front yard. Even though these trees are dormant during the winter, as are a lot of our plants, they still need a little water. We get enough winter rain most years that we don't need to supplement with irrigation, but not this year or in several years recently. After seeing my post on Facebook about the water catchment system in my shower, my friend Robin asked about soap in the water and whether that would hurt my plants. Well, most of the water that gets into my buckets has totally missed me, and so it doesn't have any soap in it. But even if the water was soapy, it wouldn't hurt anything. The concentration of soap would be that would not be that high, and soaps these days no longer contain phosphates, which used to be a problem. 
I've even had viewers tell me that they use a plastic basin to wash their dishes so that they can then use that dirty water on the garden afterward, which is still perfectly fine. But if you have a lot of food residue in the water, you might want to pour that on your compost pile instead. Our plant this week is black pearl pepper, capsicum annuum black pearl. This pepper is a real beauty in the landscape. It's a lovely little annual that can actually live much longer if you keep it in a container and bring it indoors before temperatures drop into the 40s. But it's also easily replaced each year and has a sculptural, almost shrubby growth habit. Black Pearl is a deep, glossy black, which is truly unique, and it makes a striking addition to any landscape. The fruit do indeed look like black pearls, but as they ripen, they turn a surprisingly bright red. Black Pearl gets about two feet tall and wide and thrives in the full blazing sun. Good drainage is important, so if you have heavy clay soil, be sure to add lots of compost and don't overwater. Although the fruit's edible, Black Pearl's an ornamental species, and most people don't use the fruit for cooking. But if you do, be forewarned. They are very hot, over 30,000 Scoville units. A better use of the fruit might be to let it ripen on the plant then harvest it and let it dry completely before removing the seeds and saving them to plant next year. Plant the seeds indoors in February or March for planting outdoors in late April or early May once the nighttime temperatures are reliably in the 60s. Black Pearl will start to flower in early summer and will be covered in fruit all the way through fall. To do in your garden this week, keep an eye out for weeds in your lawn. I've started to notice that henbit is beginning to pop up in my yard, and it'll sure be easier to pull out now than once the lawn starts to reemerge in a few weeks. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions or plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne, and I'll check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. We tend to have a lot of pruning chores in the garden, especially in late winter and early spring. And uh, using a sharp pair of shears or loppers is going to make the job a lot easier. Your hands will tire less quickly and you can get more jobs done more quickly. And uh, it's just much more of a pleasure to use a sharp pair of shears. And uh, this is a pair of Felco shears. This one has a rotating handle. This handle rotates back and forth with your hands. So if you're doing a lot of pruning, these uh, will tend to be less stressful for your hands. Uh, this pair has been sharpened nicely. It's got a nice shiny bevel on the blade and I've uh, taken care to clean all of the sap that's collected on the blades uh, over time. A lot of plants like especially uh, rosemary and, and eucalyptus and pine really produce a lot of sap and make your shears really sticky and you'll get a lot of residue in here and that tends to make your shears not open and close as easily. Uh, you lose the spring action. This pair of shears also needs to have uh, the bevel sharpened quite a bit and the springs tend to get very dirty and you'll get a lot of dust and dirt that will collect in the joints of your pruner. So you wanna make sure that you prune, clean those up. Same is true with your lopping shears. And uh, with a pair of lopping shears like this, you need to do uh, quite a bit of cleaning to get them ready to go. I'll first use a, a piece of sandpaper and clean off any sap. And you wanna use a fine sandpaper. This is a 400 grit, 300 or 400 grit. We'll take off a lot of that built up material that gets on your blades. And if you have a more, uh, a heavier level of dirt or even rusty shears, you may even want to use a small wire brush. And you can put a little bit of uh, oil. I like to use just the kitchen spray oil. But again, if your pruners are very rusty or very, very dirty, you might even wanna use like a three-in-one oil. And I work those shears back and forth. I'm gonna be using a uh, whetstone to uh, do the actual sharpening. And I like to keep it in a towel uh, so that it stays uh, nice and clean. And this is a stone oil. Now your stones have a uh, fine side and a coarse side, usually the lighter colored side is going to be your fine side. And you wanna make sure that the stone is really oiled. You can see that that oil soaks into the stone and you wanna use a special sharpening oil. You'll start out with the uh, more 
coarse side, but I'm gonna give this just a little bit of scrub and clean up some of that uh, dirt and dust that's collected in the, in the nooks and crannies there and uh, wipe that off. And then on your sharpening, you're going to sharpen just on the side with the bevel. Make sure that your stone is matching the same angle as the bevel that you have on the tool. Do long, straight strokes until you've got a nice shine and a nice clean edge. You might need to use your stone on the other side just to take off any burrs. And then when you're out in the garden sharpening, if you need to do just a little bit of touch up, you can keep a little pocket pruner like this or a little pocket stone in your pocket and just give it a nice couple of strokes to keep it nice and clean. You'll do the same thing with scissors and shears. You can use the stone on those to keep those nice and clean so you can do all your gardening with a nice clean edge. For Backyard Basics, I'm Tricia Shirey. Thanks for joining us. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and be sure to like us on Facebook. Next week, see how to get rid of Bermuda grass. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.